Welcome back to Inclusion Revolution. I'm your host, Tova Sherman, and of course my guest Brad Proctor has agreed to stay. Now I was harassing him a little on break, and Brad, what I learned that I really was interested in is that your firm actually offers what I would consider to be preventative training, really, in, in, in saying this is how we can avoid it. And I know you were saying that the cost of litigation or, or dealing with these complaints can often yeah. be far greater than, than just getting some training. So will you tell me a little bit about how that evolved? Sure, and it's interesting. I mean, you were talking about your, your training experience as well, and that's what the market, and that's what the work, that's what industry is looking for, is training. Because if someone gets embroiled in litigation, let's say it's a human rights complaint, a human rights complaint to the Human Rights Commission, those will, you know, unfold for approximately two, three, four years. And there's a significant amount of expense, uh, of, of, of management time that gets invested in that process. And so at the end of one of those uh, processes, a client said to me, you know, we'd appreciate knowing, you know, what we could do to try and avoid this thing in the future, avoid this type of... Uh, I'm glad to hear that, actually. Good. And, so, and so one of the things that we do at McGinnis Cooper, and we have 25 people like myself doing management side uh, labor and employment law throughout our four provinces is we do a lot of training on a lot of different things and the, the training that we would do that would kind of help employers in this area would be helping them understand and navigate the pre-employment process so the applications and what they can and can't ask uh, the second would be kind of the duty to accommodate and uh, if, if I'm asked to accommodate if I get the doctor's note that doesn't give me much information what do I do from there and performance management and often performance management and the duty to accommodate go hand in hand because you're performance managing someone and you don't realize until a certain point that well geez the reason why they can't meet this metric is because of a limitation or restriction you know I have this saying which means nothing to anyone but me but the fish stinks from the head and what I've <laughs> Don't drink while you're laughing. But what I mean by that, and I am a maritimer, but what I mean by that is if the manager's not buying in, if the leader of the group, whether it's a large, uh, well, a great example is large banks, I can go into one of their, their branches six blocks away from the other, and in one, they're all sitting at the teller seat, which of course is the entry level, and at the other bank, they're all standing, which again means everyone's standing far too long on the floors. And sometimes what I've identified in my, in my training and going in and visiting my clients' different locations, some of the larger clients, is really that it comes down to that manager really, frankly, buying in to the belief that accommodation is not a special treatment, right. but actually a way of equalizing the playing field. That's right. And, and, and how do we and respond? Recruiting, and, I mean, and I think that uh, being an inclusive workplace should come from the, the board, the CEO, and permeate the whole organization. And those types of values, uh, w when you're interviewing people and they see your, your corporate values, it's going to attract them to your organization and it's going to retain people as well if they know that you're an organization that is focused on being an inclusive workplace. Understood. And I like the fact that your training is so complementary to, to my belief, which is, and the training I do for employers, which is really to raise awareness and understanding of the ease of accommodation and that it's not special to equalize a playing field, but as I said before, equal. And those messages, really, people seem to get them when they're given over, and I'm sure you find this as well, in that when the training's over, everybody's going, wow, that wasn't so terrible, or that's not such a onus, you know, you know, such a difficult thing to, that's you right. know, do. And I think that's why the training is so essential. You'll find in doing the training that there are a number of managers that, uh, you know, we're doing the right thing already. Uh, but you'll find that there's a handful usually of people that really didn't get it and were doing the wrong thing and those are the individuals that will expose you to potential claims and, and liability. And nobody wants that on either side and that's why I'm pleased. So let's do our top three employer and top three em uh, potential employee, I'll take those, um, advice to avoid getting to these places. So you start. Employers, what are your three most important messages? Well, my top three messages would be uh, you know, have uh, processes and policies in place. Most employers start off very small, there's an owner, there may be an employee or two, and you can get by without processes or policies at that stage. But as you grow, and as you start having maybe a couple of different people out there interviewing people or recruiting people, and they're doing things differently because their understandings aren't the same, that's where you're going to get into trouble. So policies, processes, that's, that's tip number one. Tip number two is, is in your, your job ads, 
in your interview, in your demands for pre-employment medicals, make sure that you know your job well, the job, and what the core duties of it are. So if you're saying you must be able to, uh, I go back to my telephone pole example, climb telephone poles, and you really don't, then you're going to once again expose yourself to potential claims and liability. And thirdly, uh, education and knowledge is very powerful. And I'm not saying uh, that you need to call uh, McInnes Cooper or, or your whatever lawyer you use, but there's a lot of information available on the internet through human rights commissions and other papers and things, uh, and training programs offered by uh, outside organizations such as McInnes Cooper that you can educate your, your managers on how to work through the process and make right decisions that don't expose you to liability. Okay, my turn. Your my turn. My three. I feel like we're on one of those sports things. <laughs> you know, now it's me. And here's my three quickly. For those of you applying for jobs who live with disabilities, number one, read the job ad very carefully. Understand whether you feel it's inclusive or not. Look into the company you are applying to, number two, and make sure that, you know, ask friends, look at their website, whatever. Be prepared for that. And number three, know your disability, know your limitations, and know how to communicate that if looking at that job ad you identify some challenges now Brad I have to thank you because at the end of every show I try to squeeze in a little poll and a little bit of news relating to our subject so I'll ask you to be patient while Certainly. I do a quick little uh, news episode which is common accommodations for persons living with mental health issues are as simple as flexible scheduling changes in supervision changes in training modifying of some job duties or even job coach assistance which a lot of employers don't think about so so my question today for everybody is, do you think it's an employer's responsibility to accommodate their employers? Forget employees. And forget what uh, Brad said. This is your opinion. InclusionRevolution.com. Let us know what you think. For this week, I'm Tova Sherman, hoping you'll join us at Eastlink TV for every Sunday night at 8.30 and every Monday, Friday to 3 for more Inclusion Revolution. Don't miss it.